<laughs> Hello, everyone. This is our 15th lecture. Getting pretty close to the end. We're talking about other GLMs. So we talked about logistic already. That's a, it deserves its own lecture because it's such a common GLM used in our fields. But there's others that are similar and can handle different distributions than what Logistic is built for. The ones we're going to go over today are Probit, Poisson, Beta, and Zero Inflated Regressions. So first, let's review the gist of GLM. So we are modeling the expected value of our outcome in a slightly different way, if you remember. What we're doing is essentially wrapping the outcome, the predicted outcome, in a hug. It's a link function that changes a distribution that is tougher to work with to something that's a lot easier for regression to work with. So the predictors, we're going to be using them just like we do in regular regression. The only thing that's going to change is how we interpret the coefficients. So what's important with understanding all these GLMs is that the link and distribution we pick are based on our theoretical understanding of what our outcome variable is like. We can aid our theoretical understanding by looking at distributions. We can look at a histogram of our variable. Uh, but ultimately, we need to pick it based on this is what we believe this variable really is like out there in the wild. So we've talked about a with an outcome distribution that's binary. We've talked about logistic regression. Turns out Probit also works. It uses a binomial distribution like logistic, but instead of a logit link, it uses a Probit. We also have counts where we use a Poisson. There's bounded where we use beta. Uh, and then there's zero inflated count. It's count uh, outcomes where there's a lot of zeros. So most people don't have any counts, but some do. And there's different ways of handling that one as well. So we'll start with probit regression. What's nice about this is it's really similar to logistic, but it just has a different link. And it's used a ton in economics, but I'd I haven't really seen it a whole lot in other social sciences. So just some background here. This model is looking at whether you're in a high violent or low violent state. It's just binary. And we're predicting it based on poverty percent, the population, which is a census variable here, and then a categorical variable called high teen birth. From this, we used uh, a binomial uh, distribution with a link equals probit in this case instead of logit and this is our output it's just like logistic where you can get predicted probabilities and average marginal effects the coefficients when positive mean that for an increase in that variable there's an increase in the predicted probability of the outcome for example, for a one unit increase in poverty percentage, there is an increase in the probability of having high violence controlling for population and team birth, as you can see here in this example output. For the categorical predictor, in this case, uh, high teen birth versus lower. For states with lower teen birth rates, there is a decrease in the probability of high violence than states with high teen birth rates controlling for poverty and population. So you see we have that negative value for lower. So we have negative 1.488, which is significant. If you'll look there in the, the output. And what you're essentially seeing there is that when you're in a lower teen birth state versus a higher you have a lower probability so again for states with lower teen birth rates there's a decrease in the probability of high violence than states with high teen birth rates 
The next one we're gonna talk about is Poisson regression. And these are for count outcomes and the really counts without a ton of zero counts. Uh, I'll show some distributions, what they look like so you can get an idea. But the way that Poisson works is that you're gonna have this Poisson distributed error term and your link is going to be a log. So with this setup, one thing to note is there's not a clear cutoff of where there's just too many zeros or not. Uh, it's just something to get a feel for as you, if you're working with these kind of data a lot, then it's something you'll start to see. But for the most part, if they look like these distributions, then you're probably uh, in the right ballpark with a Poisson. So note that just like you saw with the T distribution, there's a bunch of distributions for it depending on some parameters. For the Poisson, there's only one parameter. It's called lambda. And the lambda value is both the mean and the variance in the Poisson distribution. So the lambda value for the purple is one. So our mean is one and our variance is one. For the blue, our mean is two and our variance is two, etc. So depending on where our mean is for our distribution, that is going to determine what the shape should look like. So when you're looking at your outcome variable and trying to get a feel for what it, what distribution it has, one of the things to note is where's the mean and is the mean value similar to the variance value in your data. And then based on that, you can look for, does it look like these distributions? And one important aspect of this is that the cutoff is at zero. With counts, you can't have anything negative. So it starts at zero and goes forward. So these are all right skewed. Uh, once it becomes, once your mean is a lot higher, like 16 in this case, where the, it's a yellow distribution, it starts to look a lot more normal. But for these lower counts, they're going to be generally pretty heavily right skewed. Here, this is an example of a Poisson regression where we're looking at TV hours. So it's how many hours of TV people are watching a day. And they're just counts. Start at zero and go forward from there. And we're predicting it based on age, income, and education. And note, we just say family equals Poisson in quotes. And it'll run a Poisson regression with a log link. And with this output, we can look at the interpretation of these coefficients. And it's the coefficients themselves are the change in the logs of the outcome for a one unit increase in the predictor. What's nice is just like when we were talking about log lin models and log log, this approximates to a percent change. In other words, for a one unit year increase in education, there is a 3% decrease in the hours of TV watch per day. So if you look at the education coefficient, it's really negative 0.03. If we times that by 100, we get three. And so we got this for a one year increase in education, there's a 3% decrease in the hours of TV watch per day. Similar approach can be done for age and income here as well. We can also get the AMEs out just like we did with logistic regression. In this case, uh, our AMEs for age is 0.02, for education it's negative 0.08, and for income it's essentially zero, although it's significant because the units for income are in dollars. So we could adjust that to make it more interpretable. But when it comes to the interpretation, just like logistic, uh, we can get this average marginal effect and it turns it into the outcome unit again. 
So the AME is interpreted as for a one year increase in education, there's an associated 0.09 hour decrease in hours of t watching TV per day. So for a one unit increase in education, there's a 0.09 decrease in hours of watching TV per day. So we have both 3% decrease, which is the nonlinear relationship. And then we can average those out to get this AME. They're both gonna give you different pieces of the puzzle of what the data are trying to tell us about the situation. So that's Poisson, that's for counts without a ton of zeros. Another one is beta regression. This is one of my favorites. Don't really know why, but it's for bounded outcomes. So like between zero and 100. So if you're looking at test scores. Now notably, there's gonna be some test scores if they're just nicely distributed in the middle, they're normally distributed uh, there's really no one at the top or bottom, then you don't have to use beta regression per se. But it's really good when you have people at the very top or at the very bottom, or there's a weird distribution in there which happens a lot with bounded outcomes. I'm gonna show you some of the distributions in just a moment. But the idea is that it's very flexible. It can handle a lot of different shapes that often come with bounded outcomes. Now what's cool is by default they use a logit link. So the interpretation becomes just like logistic regression. One of the limitations of beta regression is the outcome cannot be at the bounds. It can't be zero or 100, but it can be everything in between. If it is at the bounds, we have to make a small adjustment to the outcome and there's a formula for that. It just makes a small adjustment to everything and just scoots it in and it works just fine. So I promised that I'd show you some of the distribution, some ways that uh, this beta distribution can look. And the beta distribution has two parameters, A and B, and they're basically things that the regression model will figure out while it's uh, fitting to the data. And if you look across these five distributions, you can see that they're quite a wide variety. Basically all the other ones that we've seen so far are very similar in shape. They may just change how peaked they are, but the beta regression can handle this bimodal like you see in the first one. It can handle this really round hill. It can handle something more normal. It can handle these highly skewed distributions both at the top or the bottom. It's a really flexible approach. When it comes to actually running it, we have to use a package called beta reg. And inside of that package, there's a function also called beta reg. It's not a built-in function in R, but this works just like you've had before, where you have the outcome, tilde, and predictors. So we're looking at the percent knowledge, which is a bounded outcome because it's a percent, predicted by income, education, and age. The output here includes the coefficients and then the fee coefficients. And in this case, that is an extra part of the beta regression model that we're, we don't have time to talk about here, but you actually can model the variance as well. You can see if there are predictors that predict the variability in the outcome, not just the location of it. So. For example, what we normally do is we say for a one unit increase in income, there's some unit increase in or decrease in the outcome. But with the fee coefficients, what you can do is say a one unit increase in income increases the variability in the outcome, which is pretty cool. When it comes to the interpretations of just the coefficients, What's nice is because we use the logit link, they're the exact same as in logistic regression. So we can get odds ratios, AME, and predicted probabilities. 
So an example, we could say a one year increase in education was associated with a, and we can exponentiate the coefficient. And that gives us a 1.187 increase in the odds of that the person got all questions correct. So one year increase in education was associated with a 1.2 roughly increase in the odds of that the person got all questions correct. So the percent knowledge that they got 100% on it. Of course, we can get the AMEs like I mentioned before. And here the AME would be interpreted as for a one year increase in education, there was an associated 0.04 unit increase in the outcome. We essentially can say unit increase or unit decrease in the outcome for any AME. So for here, that means for every one year increase in education, the individual got four percentage points higher on the political knowledge scale. So four percentage points, which is again different than 4% higher. In other words, if someone scored a 60%, then if they got another year of education, on average, we would expect them to score 64%. Or if they scored a 78% and they got another year of education, we would expect them to score an 82%. That's what we mean by four percentage points. It just means it moves up four percentage points on that scale. Last one we're going to talk about in any detail here are when we have zero inflated counts. So when your outcome is a count outcome, but many people have zeros. There's a lot of approaches to this. There's zero inflated negative binomial regression. Here, we're going to use this binomial and Poisson combination. So in this case, because we have a ton of zeros and a handful of people have some count, what we end up doing is we split it up into two pieces basically, where we have, are you zero or do you have a count? So that's a binomial part. So it's a no count or a count. And then the Poisson looks at the count. And when we run it, we get two pieces out, just like we would expect since we're doing two parts. So we get a count model coefficients, so that's a Poisson. And then the zero inflation model coefficients, that's a binomial with a logit link. So what we essentially have here is a Poisson plus a logistic combined together. And so the two parts, the count model and the zero inflated model, are giving you different parts of your data. What you can tell though is that this is complicated because now for a single model you have two sets of coefficients. What this means is that for the count model coefficients we're interpreting those like a Poisson regression. For the zero inflated part we're interpreting those like a logistic. Now my favorite way to interpret these is actually with AMEs. The AME actually combines both parts into one estimate, which is really nice when it comes to trying to interpret it. So in this case, for a one unit increase in person, so how many there are in your, your group, there is a 3.2 increase in the count of fish caught. Or for a one unit increase in children, so the number of children you're bringing, there's a 4.9 unit decrease in the count of fish caught. No, no surprise there if you have kids and throwing rocks in the water, they're not really helping with that. So what you're seeing is that it combined the information from the Poisson and the logistic part, and it's telling you, so if you increase how many people are coming, you tend to have an increase in the count of fish caught, in this case on average about 3.2. Or if you bring more children, there's going to be a decrease in the count of fish caught, or on average 4.9 fish less for every child you bring.
So it's important here to understand that there are many others. All of these things that are built on regression. Regression is so flexible that it can be used for so many situations. So in this class, we're really just able to introduce the basic ideas of this. Today, I really just want to broaden your horizons, help you understand all these different ways that GLMs can be used, the different situations they can be used in, and how to interpret them. I didn't go into any detail regarding the assumptions or any of that stuff. The things that we learned about in logistic regression about assumptions, those apply here with these as well. However, I do suggest if you see that one of these are, is going to be really useful for you, to look into it more and ask questions and learn more about it because most of it is built on regression and then you just need to look at all these little pieces like how do I check the assumptions for this one and what should the distribution look like for this one. Now note, there's a lot of things that we're not going to talk about in this class at all. And I wish we had some time to do it. But luckily, a lot of these things are covered in other classes. For example, structural equation modeling. This is where you can have latent variables. In other words, variables that are a combination of a bunch of others into one, into one single latent variable that doesn't have any measurement error in it. So structural equation modeling is really cool and we do have a class for that. We also have multi-level modeling and this is one that takes regression into uh, a realm of uh, repeated measures, uh, clustered data like in a classroom. So it can handle situations where the assumption of independence is violated. In other words, like with education research, you go in and you're looking at kids in a classroom. Well, they're not totally independent of each other because they're all in the same class. So multi-level modeling actually allows you to account for that while still essentially running regression. There is a class here on that as well. The survival analysis is a, another type of GLM. It's a very special type of GLM where you are essentially looking at the time to an event. So if you have data that looks like time to some event, uh, that's survival analysis. And that one's really important in a lot of fields that are looking at uh, the onset of disease or onset of poor behavior or stuff like that. Notably, there are many other GLMs. It, it is a field that just keeps expanding to new data situations. So although we covered a handful here, there are many others. With factor analyses, these are ways to understand how different items in a scale work together. Factor analysis is a single part of structural equation modeling. And so if you're interested in those, a structural equation modeling class may be the right one for you. Lastly, there's this whole area of machine learning. And a lot of these are initially built on regression, but a lot of them got a lot more complicated. And machine learning is all about prediction. So in a lot of cases, they just want to be able to predict an outcome, predict a behavior, predict uh, when something will happen. And machine learning is really good at that. And there's a lot of moving pieces there and it's a really ripe field that's changing a lot every day. And there are classes in the stat department about machine learning. I recommend if we haven't covered some of the data situations that you know that you're going to encounter in your research career. Please look into it and reach out with questions. I have experience with a lot of these analyses and have seen how they can be used in a lot of different situations. So if you are curious, please reach out and ask questions. For the stuff we've covered today, check out these resources. There's Poisson and beta regression and zero inflated count regression. Uh, these will help clarify anything that I missed in today's lecture. I know I went quickly. That is kind of the design of this lecture. We're not going into a whole lot of depth here, but
but please re-watch this if you have uh, questions about interpretation, reach out. And as always, it's nice to finish on a beautiful picture. This one's by Simon Berger it's from Unsplash. So shout out to, to Simon for giving us this gorgeous photo.